The battle for Aleppo intensifies. The United States slaps sanctions on a Chinese firm for allegedly aiding the DPRK's nuclear program. Tension mounts between India and Pakistan and what to make of the U.S. presidential race after that first debate. Big stories and we'll tackle them all. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. On most days, we go in-depth on a single story, but once in a month, we like to take a step back from our usual format and spend a bit of time gathering fresh insight and analysis from those covering world events. To help us dive into these issues, we've put together a distinguished panel of journalists. Joining us from Geneva is CCTV correspondent Liu Xian. With us here in Washington is Simon Marks. He's the president and chief correspondent for Feature Story News. Author and commentator Farhana Kazi joins us from Islamabad and CCTV correspondent Leling Tan is with us from New York. Let's go to New York and Leling Tan and talk about Syria. Uh, Leling, Russia and the United States brokered a ceasefire which fell apart very quickly. Uh, we talked with the UN Special Envoy for Syria, Stefan de Mistura, and asked him about that and said, what happens next? And he said, basically, he told me, there is no plan B. We have to rescue this deal. We have to salvage this ceasefire deal. What is the situation right now? Well, the situation, Anand, is uh, deteriorating. It's getting worse. In fact, it might be at one of the worst points uh, in this conflict so far, uh, given the kind of progress that we had seen a little bit of has now been erased uh, completely for the most part. Now, in Aleppo, fighting is intensifying, and at the Security Council, uh, we have a deadlock. In Aleppo, Syrian government forces, uh, as you may have read, uh, aided by Russian warplanes and Iranian ground support, um, is laying siege on Aleppo, trying to take back the territory from rebels. And we're hearing uh, reports from UN officials and human rights agencies about the use of bunker buster bombs that are essentially burying uh, women and children under rubble. They're using incendiary bombs, what's commonly known as fire bombs. And they're also targeting hospitals and first responders. Uh, in what's known as a double tap assault. So basically, they strike a target, paramedics come in, and then that's when the, the second strike occurs. So a lot of the injured civilians are now less likely to get the emergency medical assistance that they need. Now, the Security Council is, of course, infuri infuriated by the latest developments, but unable to agree on what to do. In the past two weeks, we've seen infighting within the council with Syria and Russia accusing the U.S., its allies and Syrian rebels of, uh, of fueling the conflict and of uh, for, for having ruptured that ceasefire that had been in place for a week, a ceasefire that was brokered by the U.S. and Russia. And in turn, we have the U.S., its allies and Syrian rebels uh, accusing Russia and Syria of uh, that aid convoy attack on Monday, on September 19th, that effectively unraveled the ceasefire, but also um, accusing Russia of hypocrisy, saying that it's bombing Aleppo on one hand, while it is uh, trying to push for a ceasefire here at the Security Council. So we're seeing a lot of a lot of that kind of uh, vitriol here at the Security Council. Stefan de Mistura has said that a military solution is not a solution, but time and again, we're seeing diplomacy here failing Syria. All right, let's look at that military uh, solution is not a solution. Simon, uh, that interview that we had with uh, Stefan de Mistura, this is what he had to say about the chances for peace. Let's watch. None of the countries who have an influence or who are sponsoring or supporting one side or the other even dream that uh, there is a possibility of a military solution. They may be wanting to be in a better position at the time of the negotiation, but no solution on the military nature. That is an important point, which means that regardless of what we are seeing, at the end of the day, there will be a need of a serious discussion. Yet Bashar al-Assad thinks there is a military solution. He is saying that he will unleash his military to reclaim every last inch of land that he's lost. Yes, and that, at the end of the day, may well be true. At the end of the day, maybe there will be a political negotiation. But this is clearly not the end of the day. It's not the end of the day from Bashar al-Assad's perspective. It's certainly not the end of the day from President Vladimir Putin's perspective. And I think the events that we've witnessed, particularly over the last week, have underscored not just the relative powerlessness of the United States in this situation, 
situation to effect any real and meaningful ceasefire. But they have also really damaged Secretary of State John Kerry. He was told, he was warned by people within the Obama administration, other people who sit around the cabinet table with him, Defense Secretary Ashton Carter among them, that trying to hammer a ceasefire plan out with the Russians, putting your faith in the Russians was a mistaken tactic and it was going to blow up in your face. And Secretary of State John Kerry said, no, this is the only game in town. This is what we have to do. We have to try and pursue this. It has blown up in his face, and it's blown up in his face very badly, where he's calling Moscow and saying to Sergei Lavrov, if you don't put pressure on the Syrians to stop this kind of bombing, I'm walking away from the discussion with you. And the Russians are going, well, okay, fine, so walk away. I mean, they don't, they're not, it's that, there's no threat there that the United well, States any longer has. He'd be walking away from his own deal. Yes, he'd be walking away from his own deal, and also uh, he's relying on the Russians to say, oh yes, this loss of civilian life is absolutely terrible, we must go, yeah, we totally understand that and we'll come to the table. Moscow's not going to do that. Well, let's bring in Leo Shen. she is in Geneva, and uh, Leo Shen, to what extent uh, is this something of a proxy war between the United States and Russia that we are seeing in Syria right now, a fight for influence in this country? Yeah. Well, I'd first like to address what uh, we just heard uh, uh, just um, seconds ago. I don't think uh, the Russians or uh, anybody would like to see innocent life lost. Uh, we are talking about a bloody war here, it's a life and death, so there will be casualties, and some of these casualties can and should be avoided. This is, uh, I think, the consensus of everybody who has a heart around here. I was at the press conference where uh, Kerry and his uh, Russian counterpart, Lavrov, was announcing this deal. And I tell you, the biggest question uh, everybody had uh, on their mind that particular night is whether or not the, the, the goodwill of these two people, of these two persons, can trans in, translate into real trust between these two nations, between these two partners, so that they can really work together to solve the Syria issue. And it turned out that uh, um, I think they were too optimistic, as we just heard. Uh, Kerry was not given the support uh, to... to um, Put, push forward what he announced that evening and the angry exchange of words that happened after the the mistake shooting down of the mistake killing of some uh, Syrian troops on the ground uh, also show the very bitter relationship between these two countries. And when you have such a lack of trust, it is really difficult. And when you are constantly accusing the other of being the bad guy, you cannot work together. So I don't think this is the right atmosphere at all for Russia and the United States to, to work together and help solve this problem. And then um, the United States is also and Russia probably do not have enough clout to influence the situation on the ground, whether they like it or not. So that is why this war is so difficult to bring to an end. And then we're talking about all kinds of uh, military financial assistance pumping in uh, to the both sides of this uh, opposition. Um, this is not going to end because the whole world's, the whole world's resources is behind the, the warring parties. Let's go to Farana. And Farana, we've seen the ceasefire deal descend very quickly into a pretty fierce argument between Russia and the United States right now on the role that Russia is playing in uh, Syria. Can there be peace in Syria if these two sides of Moscow and Washington are at loggerheads with each other? Well, there's an argument to be made that Russia is an important player in this crisis. And of course, Russia is the, uh, has the alliance with Syria is its only, only partner in the Middle East. Um, but I think this is beyond Russia. I mean, we also need to have secure peace with President Bashar al-Assad. Um, the, the human rights violations that he has created uh, against his own people in the country, he needs to be held accountable by the international community, by the international courts. Um, and so Russia alone cannot, the peace agreement between the United States and Russia alone is not going to de-escalate the tensions and the violence in the region. There are other international allies and partners that need to be engaged, Iran, for example, and Iraq, uh, and other uh, Middle Eastern uh, Sunni Arab allies that also have a stake in this. And so you have to involve many international players in order to secure or to make the peace deal with Russia meaningful. Okay, let's move on to our next subject. And these are the allegations made by the United States that a Chinese company has been helping the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, with its nuclear program. Let's go to Liu Xun for this. So the U.S. decides to sanction a Chinese company for helping the DPRK's nuclear program. It charges four Chinese individuals. How is this being received in China? 
Well, I think uh, the way how I see it is that, uh, of course, it is the U.S. decision to sanction individuals or companies as, as they wish. But on the other hand, uh, do they have uh, um, independently verifiable evidence that these company and these individuals have really breached the sanctions uh, that are in place? Um, do you have the, the evidences that they have done that? And have you cooperated? Have you signaled to your Chinese counterpart? and that you have these suspicions, you have these evidence, and you wish that something can be done about that. What are the official channels of uh, communication that should be followed in this case? Um, as uh, we have seen from uh, Chinese uh, official responses, uh, this is indeed a uh, legal outreach, and the Chinese um, investigative and jurisdiction authorities have the capacity and will do what they should and what they can to um, bring any criminals uh, accountable um, and uh, go after them, but uh, not, um, you know, accepting being pointed finger at just by being accused that the Chinese that some Chinese company or individuals uh, have done something wrong, and uh, that um, probably with the acknowledge or the acceptance of the Chinese government either. Right, it does raise uh, issues of jurisdiction. Simon, let's listen to what the Chinese ambassador to the United States had to say about these U.S. allegations. The company is a private company. Uh, in China, and the individuals concerned are Chinese citizens. So they should be under the jurisdiction of Chinese law enforcement agencies. And Chinese law enforcement agencies are doing investigations of their activities. And we will handle this case in accordance with Chinese laws and in, in accordance with our commitment to UN Security Council resolutions. Does the ambassador have a point yet that this is a Chinese legal issue? Is the United States unilaterally extending its jurisdiction to China? Well, so there's a couple of different issues here to unpack. First of all, jurisdictional issues don't just apply in this particular case. Look at what the United States is doing, for example, uh, with respect to FIFA and the uh, allegations surrounding corruption within FIFA. Many of the people targeted by the US say, well, we're not American citizens. Why are you coming after us? To which the United States argues jurisdiction from the U.S. applies if, for example, U.S. financial organizations and institutions have in any way touched uh, the allegations that are being made. So the U.S. will defend its jurisdictional provenance on these issues in a variety of different ways and hear criticism like that from uh, countries now including China. But essentially what's taking place here is a judicial expression of diplomatic frustration on the part of the United States. The US will argue, well, the Justice Department is completely independent of politics and makes these decisions solely based on an interpretation of the law. What the United States diplomatically wants to see China do is put more pressure on North Korea to alter its behavior with regard to its nuclear aspirations. And it's impossible to, to imagine that the, these charges are being brought in some kind of a vacuum absent the desire of the United States to see more of that pressure being applied. Right, Lilling, the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang uh, told President Obama at the UN General Assembly just last week that Beijing supports closer cooperation uh, in the UN Security Council and in enforcement efforts to halt uh, North Korea's nuclear program. How is the United States and uh, China working together to halt the nuclear program? Well, here at the United Nations, uh, China and the U.S., as well as other Security Council members, are trying to negotiate right now um, a new U.N. resolution that would expand sanctions on the DPRK. And this, of course, is a response to uh, the DPRK's most recent nuclear test that has been described by most accounts as having been its biggest and baddest. So now we know China, uh, for the longest time, has always maintained that Sanctions need to be balanced with dialogue, but it has increasingly become impatient and frustrated over Pyongyang's repeated nuclear provocations. And as Simon mentioned, it is under growing pressure from the U.S. as well to do more to curb uh, Pyongyang as Pyongyang's strongest ally to curb the country's nuclear ambitions. So right now, uh, these discussions are ongoing. There is expectation that the Security Council resolution would be adopted when it's ready. 
But compared to U.S. sanctions, for example, where there's a little bit of gray area, U.N. Security Council sanctions uh, carry a bit more weight, maybe more restrictive because they're more universal, they fall under international law, and also because China is a permanent member of the council itself. Liu Xun, you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to uh, make a quick comment about what was discussed in the studio. I think uh, whenever the U.S. dollar is, in, is, is involved, that you have a jurisdiction, I think that is a, a, a statement that is a bit too much. I mean, um, U.S. dollars is used in every part of this world. So are you going to say that because U.S. dollar is involved, that the U.S. government, government can go and just, uh, you know, exercise jurisdiction on any part of the world? I think obviously that's not the case. But I do agree that it is an expression of diplomatic frustration. But I would take it one step further and say that this is diverting the public attention and blame on the stalemate, on the impasse on this uh, DPRK nuclear issue to China, Think, say, implying basically that Chinese companies and Chinese individuals have been um, helping the DPRK develop its nuclear uh, nuclear weapons so that this uh, crisis will never end. I, I think that is ultimately the kind of message that uh, uh, is perceived uh, uh, here. And I think that is uh, quite a naive uh, move, because if you really look into the history of the DBRK nuclear crisis, it is not China who started this. It is not China who got the matter worse. It is precisely the United States with its uh, very difficult relationship with the DPRK that have to be worked on here. And, and there is where the the, uh, the lesson is. In Chinese, we have a saying, if you want to open a knot, it has to be the person who tie the knot. And here, it is the United States who should do this, who should take a closer look at their policy.